If you open your Bibles this evening to Hebrews chapter 2, verses 10 through 15. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10 through 15. That's where we'll be this evening. Um, as we get into this, uh, I, I want to just stress something that Gabe said very wisely when he was preaching on Sunday, that there are many aspects of the Advent as we go through it that we can't dive into each and every one of them. Like we saw on Sunday, we got, we got to take some deep dive into the star and to the wise men, but there were many questions about the Pharaoh and Egypt and where Christ was sent that we couldn't get into. And it will be again the same this evening. Once again, reinforcing the value of doing this every year. There is an infinite amount of depth to the concept of God becoming man and how he chose to do that. Last Sunday, we understood that wise men will call Christ king. And we have the literal fulfillment of that in the Magi. That's what that word means, wise men. The king makers who came and proclaimed Christ king. That statement, that, that action by them applies to all men of all time, all people of all time. Wise people, wise men, wise kings, wise rulers will call Christ king. This was written in the Old Testament in Psalm 2, where Psalm chapter uh, 2, verse 10 through 12 reads, Therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry, and you perish from the way, for His wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. We meditate this evening on the incarnation, the event, the advent, the first advent of our Lord. We are talking about a, a, a union between two aliens. As we continue, as we go, as we meditate on the incarnation, we understand that God bridged a gap that no human ever could. God stepped into a space and brought him to himself humanity in a way no one could approach. The wise spirit, Father God, created a bridge into physicality with the Son. And through the Son, he became, the Spirit became flesh. The scriptures are absolutely clear in the distinction between the physical, the flesh, the scriptures call it, and the Spirit. These are two realities that God speaks of all the time within the Scriptures. Jesus said it in John chapter 4, verse 24. He said, God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. John, uh, John also said that no one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side, has made Him known. Christ comes, the incarnation comes, and brings a perfect revelation of who God is. Bridges a gap between something we can never see, never touch, never feel, never have a real intimate relationship with. In the incarnation, we, are, we see God Himself. We know this because Jesus told His disciples as such. As he was getting ready to depart. It was near the end of his time here on earth. And he was preaching to them in the upper room. He was reminding them of all the truth that he had said before over and over and over again. In John 14, he said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known the Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. It's interesting because the disciples didn't quite get it. Philip, one of the disciples, answered him and says, Lord, show us the Father and it's enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. In order for men to see the way, the truth, and the life, it was necessary for the way, truth, and the life to become visible to bring the perfect revelation of God. The author of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, that 
Long ago, and in many times and many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. The perfect revelation of God comes in the Incarnation. When those magi that we were speaking about on Sunday, those wise men, gazed and worshipped the King of Kings as a lowly baby, they saw the perfect revelation of who God was. But the Incarnation isn't only a revelation. It's also propitiation. And that's why the title of this sermon is called The Centrality of the Incarnation. As we will discover, as we read, and as we meditate, the Incarnation is central to everything. That's why it's not, the sermon title isn't, The Incarnation is Central to Salvation, or The Incarnation is Central to Revelation. No, the Incarnation of Christ is central to everything. We can rightly say, The incarnation is central and stop right there because there's nothing we can put after it that is not defined by it. So let's go from Hebrews chapter 1 to chapter 2 and we'll read verse 10 through 15. If you are able, please stand for the reading of God's word. For it was fitting that he... For whom, by, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sacrifices and those who are sanctified, excuse me, he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him again. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since, therefore, the children share in the flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook, partook of the same. And that through death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through the fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. May God bless the reading of his holy, infallible, and sufficient word. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we gather this evening, give us a small glimpse into the centrality of Christ's incarnation in our lives. As the two infinitely removed spheres, humanity and God, were brought together in an infant, an infant who shared in our suffering and our pain, in our temptation and our difficulties, and brought victory, the life eternal, the way, the truth, and the life that came through him. Through that conduit, Lord, through that baby flows the very lifeblood of eternal life, God's essence himself, into his chosen people. Lord, we ask for just a small glimpse of this, that it may strengthen us and empower us to be faithful servants in all we do, so that our work and our life may be pleasing to our Lord and King Jesus. In his name we pray, in the name of Jesus, amen. The In verse 10 of Hebrews chapter 2, the author starts with the statement that it was fitting. Let's read verses 10 and 11 and then meditate on that thought for a minute. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, the author writes and says, For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sacrifices and those, excuse me, I keep messing up that word. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. Now, we could easily spend the whole evening on those first four words. 
for it is fitting, for it is, the, the, the Greek word would be befitting or appropriate or right that God does these things. When we think of God's character and that everything that he does, we know this and understand this, that everything he does is fitting and appropriate because it's righteous. Everything that God does is right and good. So when the scriptures proclaim that he sent him to be crushed for our sins, we confess immediately this is right. So as we read in Hebrews and the author says this is fitting, we say amen because we know the character of God. And then the he, the author doesn't leave us blind to. He for whom and by whom all things exist. This title, this this definition, this attribute that is being described here by the author of Hebrews is applied to both the Father and the Son throughout Scripture. The He, God Himself, the one perfect Trinity, found it fitting to send His Son, to unite His Son to humanity, for whom and by whom all things exist. This title belongs only to God. Unless we forget, he is the one who willed his death. This is part of the story. As we talk about the coming of Christ, and as I talked four weeks ago about the necessity of being an ambassador, of knowing the story, of being able to proclaim who Christ is, central to this story is the fact that he was sent and his death. The baby was born. We celebrate the Advent. Right now, it is easy to put out of our minds Easter. That's several months from now, right? That we won't be celebrating that till later next year. But it is central to the story. The baby that was born is the man who would die. And the scriptures declare in Isaiah 53.10, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He was put to grief. And when his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. He was crushed, but he sees his offspring. He was crushed, he was put to grief, but his days are prolonged. And lest we think again that these words are excluded from Christ himself, the one who is in through and all through, Christ says it himself, for this reason, this is John chapter 10, verse 17, for this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. When we understand the love of God, and it says Yahweh was pleased to crush him, to put him to grief for our sins, Christ came and says, I am that God. I have the authority to do this, and I will do it, and it's pleasing to me and my Father for it to be done. The author of Hebrews continues and makes it very clear what was pleasing to God. What was Christ's mission? Hebrews 2 verse 10 says the the founder and salvation of their faith to be perfected through suffering. The one for whom all exists, is pleased that the founder, Christ, of salvation would be perfected through suffering. Again, thinking about the centrality of the incarnation to this story. Can God suffer? The answer is no. God cannot suffer. God cannot die. God cannot bleed. These things are natural to the creature, not to the infinite character. Some have and will cite Acts chapter 20, verse 28. And I bring this up because I have faced this, and I want to share it with you, brothers and sisters. Some will read Acts chapter 20, verse 28, and say, well, the Apostle Paul says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Say, Look right there, it says it was God's blood. But the reality is God is spirit. God cannot bleed. He has no physical form. The only way that God can bleed is by taking on flesh to himself. And we see the necessity of the centrality of our confession. In the, in the old language, in the, in the Latin, the, we confess Christ as vera deus, vera homo. 
translated very God and very man. I appreciate R.C. Sproul's explanation of this. He says the word very in our language is too broad. We need to understand that in the Latin it means truly. We confess Christ as truly God and truly man, so that in the one person of Christ, the two natures, the eternal life and the nature that could take on death, the human nature, existed. I don't have the quote. I was looking for it today, and I, I, I read this a, a while ago, and I, it, it stuck in my mind, and I've, I, I wish I had written down the citation. John Calvin had once said that when discussing the person of Christ, the scriptures often leap from one to another, from one nature to another, excuse me. So that as the Apostle Paul speaks to the Ephesian elders and says this is a church which God has purchased with his own blood, he upholds the truth that Jesus is very God and at the same time very man. This is not a new belief. This is what Christians have confessed from the very beginning. One of the earliest apologists for the Christian faith, a man who wrote extensively dealing with all kinds of Christological heresies. Irenaeus, who was writing about 150 AD, he says, For he, this is Christ, fulfills the bountiful and comprehensive will of his Father, inasmuch as he himself is Savior of those who are saved, and the Lord of those who are under authority, and the God of those who, uh, whose things have been formed, not or excuse me, the only begotten of the Father, the Christ who was announced, the wor- and the Word of God who became incarnate when the fullness of time had come, at which the Son of God had become the Son of Man. We confess that Jesus' eternal nature, His divine nature is eternal. It is from the very beginning. His human nature begins in the womb of a virgin in Galilee. And why is this? The author of Hebrews in chapter 2 says, For he who sanctifies and those who sanctify all have one source. Jesus' human nature has the same source as we do, his divine nature. The easiest way to picture this is... I've thought many years about how to begin to describe this, to provide an analogy. How do you provide an analogy for an eternal, infinite God becoming a baby in a manger? And the easiest way, I think, to do it is to describe it as two spheres touching at one point. If you think about it this way, God, infinite, eternal, is one of those spheres. He is completely separate from humanity. He has no physical nature. He has, there, there is an alienation. He is perfectly holy, perfectly powerful, perfectly wise. And on this hand you have humanity. Perfectly corrupt. Perfectly fallible. Sinners. The gulf between those two is immeasurable. And then they touch at one point. That point is the incarnation. As God himself bridges a gap that no human can and enters into physical reality. And that one single point, that one conduit, is the way, the truth, and the life. Through that one baby and man and sacrifice, all the goodness, eternal grace, Life itself flows from God to man. Some have pictured it as spheres. Some have pictured it as a bridge. However you hold it in your mind, understand that the only connection between God and man is the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is because of His incarnation. And he goes on. 
the benefits we receive. He says, he says look, they, these, your, your sanctifier, your saver, the one who sanctifies you has the same source as you, the eternal God. And he says, this is what he does. Verse, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. He says, I will tell of your name to my brothers. The God-man comes. He's born in a manger. He recruits 12 disciples. And he says to them, you are my brothers. Just put that in context. He says, I will tell your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. It's not possible for God to call us brothers without the incarnation. We are completely separate beings. We're of different natures. I've said it several times uh, amongst us. I don't know if I've mentioned it from the pulpit, but yes, it is inappropriate and wrong for a Christian to call their pet a child. We see it a lot today. Fur babies. My pet is one of my babies, my children. But we are to live in spirit and truth. That dog or cat or whatever pet it is has no relationship to a human by nature other than being a created being. So as we think about the distance between a dog and a human, that distance actually isn't that far. If it's inappropriate for a dog to be called a human's child, how much more inappropriate is it for a created piece of dirt, a human, to be called a child of the eternal God? Yet it is. He declares in verse 13, Behold, I and the children God has given me. The author of Hebrews there is quoting Isaiah chapter 6, or excuse me, Isaiah chapter 8, which says, Bind up the testimony and seal the teaching among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord, who is my hiding, who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. And I will hope in him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are signs and portents to Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. This is a completely one-sided transaction. It's impossible for, for, for humanity to bridge this gap. But God gave him sons. Jesus declares this in John chapter 6. There are many, unfortunately, who deny the sovereignty of God and and therefore deny the power of this passage in John chapter 6. And it is a pain to my heart to think of. Because Jesus declares that, John chapter 6, verse 36, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. So we understand that all of God's elect, all of God's people, as we'll see as the author continues, are bound up in this one transaction where man, where God takes on flesh and in doing so brings many sons to glory. Of course, there's much more we could say there, but for time this evening, we'll move on to verses 14 and 15. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. The author declares, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those uh, who through fear of death are subject to lifelong slavery.
that first part, it says, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same. This is a proclamation that stands in the face of many idolatrous and evil statements that go on in our world today. The human race is one. We have one set of original parents, Adam and Eve. We have one fallen nature, and it doesn't matter whether it's encased in a brown shell or a white shell or a black shell. The human is one race. Going back to what I was saying about the inappropriateness of, of, of calling a dog a pet. A dog and a human are separate species, separate races. In our culture today, there's a redefinition of the word racism. And that redefinition is a satanic attack on our, how our Lord took the same flesh as all of humanity. The very idea of race is an attack on the reality that our Lord took on our flesh. Black people, white people, brown people, we're not of different races. We are of one race, one human nature, and Christ took on that one nature. I can't go into detail as to how many different ways defining races, separating cultures, pushing people apart, rather than bringing them to the foot of the cross where they will be united in Christ. As Paul says, there is no Jew, there is no Greek, there's no barbarian, there's no Scythian, there is Christ. Is it an attack? It is redefining what God has defined. And the incarnation is central to that definition. These are just three things we've seen so far. The incarnation is central to the revelation of God. The perfect revelation of God to humanity. The one that could be touched. Remember that Christ didn't step back and say, Well, Thomas, you have to believe it. He said, Thomas, here are my hands. Here's my side. Believe. I'm real. I'm here. Give me food to eat so that you can see I'm not a spirit. I enjoy the physical life that I have given you, and I share in it. Jesus' life, Jesus' incarnation, is central to the propitiation. Without that physical death, God can't, without that physicality, without that incarnation, God can't die. He takes on human flesh to propitiate for the world, for the sins of His elect. And notice how I've just given one example of how the Incarnation is central to combating the lies in our culture around us. Here it is 2,000 years later, and central to the truth that we proclaim is the Incarnation of Jesus Christ. There is one race. There is one group of sinners, and they can only be united to God the Father through the one way, truth, and life. The one God who became man. The Truly God and truly man. It's central to the victory of good over evil. Notice the end there, verses 14 and 15. It says, And that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, and that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Because of the incarnation Brothers and sisters, there is no more sting in death right now, and one day death itself will no longer exist. It's central to everything. So, here we are at the end. We come full circle. Four weeks ago, I asked the question, if you can tell the story of Christ's birth, I asked if that story is more influenced by the manger scene that you see driving down the road or by the scriptures that you know. I asked if you own it. Is it your story? The story of your Christ? Are you an evangelist for Christ in the same way you would be an evangelist for your favorite restaurant or your favorite sports team or your favorite beverage? 
Can you tell the world how much you love Christ and all of the details of Christ the same way you can tell the world about your favorite dish at your favorite restaurant? This is the challenge for us that will continue to come up over and over and over again, brothers and sisters, because we live in an age of distraction. There's so much on TV. There's so much on every internet website. There's so much information at our fingertips that we will be, because we are humans, distracted by it over and over and over again unless we discipline ourselves to know the Word of God, to know what it said, so that when someone comes up and asks me about the story of Jesus Christ, I can go from the advent of the angel speaking to Zechariah about the birth of John all the way through to the birth of Jesus. And even after that, I can tell them the details of the story and then I can tell them why it's important. Because the incarnation is central to everything in all of our lives. It's central to our engagement with culture. It's central to every text of Scripture we interpret. It's central to our hope in the future. Why do we no longer fear death? that great enemy that stalks all of mankind. Why is there no sting in death? Because a baby was born. God took on flesh. It's central to every hope we have. We conclude with the words from the author of Hebrews in chapter 13, verse 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of his sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.